So good morning, everybody. It's my honor to introduce um, this uh, topic today. Uh, scoliosis is one of the big uh, scourges of orthopedics. It's a classic disorder that has been prevalent in the minds of healthcare providers since antiquity. Uh, today we'll have Dr. Clayne White, our assistant professor, guide us uh, through a, a very nice uh, summary of current updates and insights on this particular disorder. And I'll ask Clayne, our assistant professor in orthopedics, to take the stage here and introduce the faculty today. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to thank Dr. Chapman for inviting us to come and lecture at the University of Washington Department of Orthopedic Grand Rounds. Uh, today we'll be talking about current uh, treatment options in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, to, we're working with me today are Dr. Wally Krangel, Dr. Kit Song, and Dr. Ted Wagner, and together we comprise the Pediatric uh, Spinal Deformity Service at Seattle Children's Hospital and here at the University of Washington uh, Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Today we'll be having several lectures, and I will start with an introduction to scoliosis, which will be followed by Dr. Song, who will be discussing current non-operative treatment options in scoliosis. And this will be followed by Dr. Krangel, who will be discussing operative treatment of scoliosis. And finally, uh, Dr. Wagner, who will be uh, giving a case presentation and then leading us in his most provocative and insightful way uh, through discussion uh, at the end. So adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is the most uh, common cause of scoliosis that we treat. Um, the definition of scoliosis is a lateral curvature of the spine, which is more than 10 degrees, is measured on an anterior-posterior or posterior-anterior radiograph. But it's really important to understand that scoliosis is more than a two-dimensional deformity. It's a three-dimensional deformity in which the primary driving force is extension of the anterior spine, which is also called a hyperlordosis or hypokyphosis, which then results in the tilt in the coronal plane and a rotational deformity of the spine. The etiology of idiopathic scoliosis is clearly idiopathic, but we think that it's probably due to an anterior overgrowth of the vertebral column. And as the anterior bodies grow, then it the spine has nowhere to go but to spin and curve, much as the way a spring would if you were to, tur to uh, turn the spring. We know that, uh, that genetics plays a large role in the etiology of, uh, of scoliosis. Uh, and we know that the 70% concordance rate between monozygotic twins is about as high as you can get in a genetic study. So this is an ad that I saw on the airplane uh, on the way home from Dallas one time. And it's, it's a little, fairly provocative in that the statement is, my scoliosis wasn't visible. And usually that's the chief complaint, is that scoliosis is a deformity that caused cosmetic concerns. But I had a problem that hurt. And I think it's a little controversial whether scoliosis actually results in any kind of pain. So this is the kind of information that we have out in the lay public. And so hopefully we can clarify uh, what scoliosis is and, and how we think about it as spinal deformity surgeons. This is uh, doc, uh, Dr. Stuart Weinstein's um, landmark article in 2003. He also had an article in the early 1980s of uh, the same cohort with uh, less follow-up. And I think the meat of this really is that if you read the conclusions that these patients who have untreated idiopathic scoliosis lead a productive and functional life at a high level at 50 year follow up and it causes little physical impairment other than some back pain and cosmetic concerns. So we know that the natural history is a little controversial but in the early studies in the 1960s, it was thought that patients with idiopathic scoliosis had a greater mortality rate. But subsequent studies have shown that truly it's the same as the general population. But these early studies included many other forms of scoliosis, including juvenile and infantile curves, as well as congenital curves, which clearly have a higher mortality rate than idiopath adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. The other uh, thought about scoliosis in the past is that it results in respiratory failure. But really, this only occurs in very large curves, more, more than 110 degrees. And it's unclear whether doing surgery on these curves actually changes that outcome. And finally, the, the thought that large thoracic curves can impair cardiopulmonary function. Again, this is very uncommon and occurs only in very large curves. But if you, if you go through Dr. Weinstein's article, I think he, he does conclude that it, there is some cardiopulmonary dysfunction, again, in large curves. And what we have to worry about is curve progression and cosmetic deformity, really, for the most part. Uh, 
And there are some issues with back pain. And I think Dr. Krangel is going to discuss more of the, uh, of the statistics of this uh, in his talk. And then there are many psychosocial concerns. But again, it's hard to predict who's going to really have problems because the, the final conclusion really is that the effect on any one individual is quite variable and very difficult to predict. And this is uh, one of the classic studies by uh, Nockhamson, Lonsey, and Winter. And so when we think about the natural history and we're trying to decide whether a patient needs to be treated for scoliosis, we want to know whether this curve is going to be bigger. And is this going to be a curve that's going to cause a true deformity or a true cosmetic concern? And so we know that patients who are younger and who have larger curves, we need to be more careful about watching. We also need to know where they stand in terms of their growth velocity. Um, girls meet, uh, reach their peak height uh, growth velocity at about age 11 and a half, and boys at 13 and a half years. And this is probably why younger children have more progression of their curve, is because they have more growth remaining. We know that curves at maturity that are less than 30 degrees are unlikely to progress to any significant degree. And that curves that are greater than 50 degrees, a, large, a majority of those will continue to progress through life at least a degree per year, as much as 20 to 25 degrees. And we also know that lumbar curves tend to progress at a smaller magnitude. So people historically have been a little more aggressive about treating lumbar curves. And this is especially true if you have some kind of lateral aesthesis of, of the curve. Now, the original study by Dr. Weinstein in 1981 uh, I tried to address the pain issue. And as you can see from his data here, there really is no difference between the general population and those patients with scoliosis in terms of pain outcomes. Now his later study, and, and Dr. Krangel is going to show that data, showed some differences long at the 50-year follow-up. The other concern that we have as orthopedic surgeons is are we going to improve their pulmonary outcome? And we, we know, at least, that curves that are larger that have a higher degree of magnitude, as shown here on the left, or that have a longer curve, as shown on the right, they tend to have much more pulmonary function impairment. Now, this is a, st a statistical difference. And again, this does not apply to any one individual. I've seen patients with 90-degree curves who have normal, quote unquote, pulmonary function tests. And so these, these are the issues, the pain, the pulmonary function, the deformity that we need to address. And this is the data that we use to base our decisions on whether we want to pursue treatment for a patient. But I think we also need to remember that as physicians that our first uh, Hippocratic rule is to do no harm. And there are many poor outcomes that can occur from scoliosis surgery. So it pays to be mindful of what we're doing. And of course, the most catastrophic would be neurologic injury. And this was the landmark article out of the 1970s of which uh, almost 1% of patients had some kind of neurologic compromise. Now, about half of these resolved completely. And follow-up studies with the advent of uh, electrophysiologic studies have shown a slight decrease in this, but it's still uh, higher than most people would realize. So just in summary, we have to decide, are we going to treat a patient or are we not going to treat them? And so our treatment decision algorithm is based on the probability of progression, which relies on the amount of growth remaining, the severity of the curve, the location of the scoliosis, the cosmetic concerns of the patient. And what we don't know, are we going to improve their long-term function, and are we going to improve their, their long-term quality of life? I think those questions still remain unanswered. We do have guidelines for treatment of scoliosis. These, uh, this is out of OKU. Uh, orthopedic knowledge update and, and SRS provides these guidelines. Generally smaller curves are treated with observation or brace therapy and larger curves meaning greater than 45 to 50 degrees are treated with surgery. So with that I'm going to move into a case that will provide some food for thought as Dr. Song gives his uh, presentation. So this is a 12 year old female who is uh, clearly uh, immature. She's RISR zero. She presented to us with a 42 degree thoracolumbar curve, was already treated in a custom thoracolumbar sacral orthosis. She came back four months later and had progressed to 46 degrees. At this point, there was some discussion with the family, should we continue bracing? Uh, this is probably one that's going to go on to surgery. If you believe everything I told you, this is a thoracolumbar curve. It's greater than, than 40, you know, 40 degrees. She's immature. She's RISR1. So this is one that's probably going to progress to surgery. Well, the family had other ideas. They went down to San Francisco and participated in the Schroth program, which is a treatment of physical therapy and bracing, which is popular in Europe. And lo and behold, six months later, she comes back with a 26-degree curve. Who knows? <laughs> 
and at two year follow up from there, she's now skeletally mature with a 30 degree curve. So was this treatment, was this natural history? It's unclear. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kit Song, who will talk to us about non-operative treatment. Well, good morning, and thank you very much for this opportunity to come and talk to you. Uh, yes, I'm a surgeon, but I do focus a lot on non-operative management of scoliosis, and I really want to uh, discuss this in some detail because there's a lot of sort of popular myth items out there in the general lay public, and you're going to be asked questions about this quite frequently. When I think of scoliosis and non-operative management, I really think back to the uh, impetus for school screening because really that was the charge that came out of this. And I think it helped us to frame our thinking and discussion around this issue. This all arose out of era of 1950s and 1960s when surgeons were presented with very large deformities in patients who seemed to have alterations in their lifespan with large morbidity and mortality. And the general feeling was we have to do something. We need to prevent scoliosis from progressing to very large deformities so that these patients don't suffer. And screening programs began initially in Minnesota and Delaware and then spread throughout the United States and Canada as well as England and it was a very popular concept throughout the world to the point where in 1989 all 50 states in the United States had some form of school screening program in place. By 2008, the wave of enthusiasm has pulled back a little bit, but this is a movement that is still heavily sanctioned and supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics, by the Scoliosis Research Society, and by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Epidemiologists tell us when we think about screening programs, we have to have certain elements present. One is that the disease should be an important problem. And I think although it's not a high incidence in the population, nobody would argue that a patient with scoliosis would perceive and have this as a very significant event and problem in their life. The disease needs to be prevalent so that screening programs can effectively pick this up. The natural history needs to be understood. And as Klain has highlighted, we have some understanding now about what happens to curves and when they may progress into the adult years. Screening should also not harm the individual, and fortunately for us, physical examination and radiographs carry very little risk to patients. An increasing topic of us and concern is the cost of screening should be reasonable compared to the cost of treatment if you detect the disease at a later state, and this is a very large public health issue now. But the areas that I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk are do we have effective tests to separate those with disease from those without disease, and especially in scoliosis, the issue of can we predict progression is a very, very hot topic. And lastly, is prognosis in fact improved by early treatment and do our non-operative interventions actually have an effect? As we apply this to adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, I think there are two parameters that we look at. Can we first identify those with disease, and this is the issue of the school screening programs. The second is, can we identify those with risk of progression? And do we have, as we said, non-operative treatments that are effective, and will they, in fact, alter the long-term morbidity, which in this case would be the progression to surgical range? Well, physical examination has been around for a long time, and unfortunately, our eyes are better than our tools. We really have still very crude tools, but it's important to understand the natural history of variation in the general population. And there have been several studies now that have looked at this. So if you look at shoulder heights, which is one of the common things that you look at in scoliosis to see if there's elevation of the scapula that might imply a thoracic curve, a variation of up to one centimeter is actually normal in the population because the descent of the scapula during embryologic development is very often not symmetric. And in fact, studies of Hollywood movie stars suggest that they are more symmetric than the rest of us, which is why they make millions of dollars. <laughs> Waist asymmetry, which is another harbinger of lumbar scoliosis, has also been found to be very common in the population that does not have scoliosis, and deviations of up to one and a half centimeters are, in fact, not rare. If you look at the thoracic rib hump on the forward Adams Bend test, which has been our mainstay of intervention and, and evaluation for a long, long time, 20% of young people and 20% of adults will have up to four or five millimeters of apparent rotation when you look at them from behind. In the lumbar spine, as many as 10% of individuals will have one centimeter of difference because oftentimes, because of handedness, you'll have an elevation and development of muscles of the lumbar spine. Bill Bunnell, in 1984, tried to put some science behind this and applied a scoliometer, which he's a sailor. I don't know Bill uh, personally, but uh, used a ship's level to try to see if he could quantify this. And he developed really a very nice evaluation looking to see if he could detect curves that on a radiograph would be greater than 20 degrees. And if you use his initial criteria of an angle trunk rotation of 5 degrees, it is 98% sensitive for picking up a curve greater than 20 degrees, but it is unfortunately not very specific, so there's a high rate of false uh, positives. 
If you increase the threshold to seven degrees, you will decrease some of the false positives, but you tend to miss some curves. And so there's been a lot of debate about which of these parameters to use, and most screening programs use a, a trunk rotation of seven degrees. But if we look at the positive predictive value of this for something that has a prevalence about what scoliosis is, which is 2 to 3 percent of the general population, and even if you have a test that is 95 percent sensitive and 95 percent specific, your positive predictive value of detection of disease or having the disease if you have a positive finding is still only 28 percent. So we have to be awfully good in screening programs, and we have to be awfully good in our assessment to really accurately pick this up. Now, why is this important? Well, most kids with scoliosis, fortunately, as Klain pointed out, will not progress. And so even though we have 2 to 3 percent of individuals in the population, if you screen the majority of these, you're going to find that only about a tenth of 1 percent will have a disease that's progressive. So what this means is if somebody comes into your office from a school screening program, just by doing nothing, you have a 97 percent negative predictive value, which means that they're likely not to have any adverse consequences. And really what we want to do is focus on, can we detect kids earlier who are likely to progress? How does this translate in the U.S. scoliosis practice? And Sukhan Shah was very kind to provide me this slide from one of his talks, where if you look at the number of kids referred in the United States from school screening programs or from pediatricians, it's about 7 million patients a year. That's an awful lot. These are then screened, and if there's referral to a spine specialist, only about 100,000 of them get referred. Of those, about 30,000 patients a year may have some intervention offered, i.e. a brace or other non-operative methods, and about 10,000 patients a year will have surgery. So this is a pretty significant economic hit to the United States, and if you think about the evaluation of every one of these patients, if we had some predictors, it would be a much better situation. So prognosis really is the central issue in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Can we identify those kids at risk of progression? And these are two examples of children with very small curves, one of whom stays very stable and doesn't change, and the other it will progress over time. Well, we have some clinical criteria that we use, and these are all relatively older studies, but the landmark study by Lonstein and Carlson that talked about risk really identified, I think, that we look at things like skeletal maturity, as Klain pointed out, we look at curve location, we look at whether they're male or female because females have a higher risk of progression, and curve magnitude at the time that they hit their big growth spurt all are predictors of whether or not there's going to be progression. This has been refined in recent years, and several studies have now come out looking at the distal phalangeal tufts of the hand, and a nice paper by Sanders in 2008 really identified that as a marker of the peak height velocity, which is when progression is most likely to progress. And Dubesay in 2000 also identified this by the presence or absence of the triradiate growth cartilage within the pelvis. The peak height velocity, as Klain alluded to, is something that has come to bear. And what we find is that all kids, girls or boys, whether they're early developers, late developers, tend to have a growth spurt. And when you look, as you see on this slide, at the various other maturity markers as they appear, the peak height velocity really has the most uh, tight correlation with the risk of great spine progression. And it predicts maximum growth better than any other maturity indicators. It's of note that in females especially, we've always looked at menarche as the onset of maturity, but 20% of girls have their big growth spurt at least two years away from the onset of their menses, either before or after. So menarche, all of these other tools are relatively indirect measures by which we can assess maturity. None of them is perfect, and you really have to use a combination of multiple of these in order to assess where a child is. So one of the big things is in 2011, as we start to evolve, is genetics going to be the answer? And can we use some of the genetic tools as we're starting to find in all other areas to help us to decide this? As Klain pointed out, twin studies and familial aggregation studies have shown that there's a very high genetic contribution to scoliosis. But all genetics experts would admit that this is a very complex topic. It's not simple Mendelian genetics and that there's probably an environmental influence as well. So the complex interplay of this has not yet been defined. There are regions of interest that have been looked at from genome-wide scans of involved families. And there are two recent studies that have really focused us on a couple of different areas. So Nancy Miller in 2005 looked at a very large aggregate of familial members who had a very strong influence of scoliosis and found that on chromosomes 6, 9, 16, and 17 that there were loci that were highly associated with progression. This was uh, further advanced by Gao in 2007, who was able to take this down into another chromosome where they identified a specific allele, which was CHD7, that had a strong association. And to date, that's the only allelic association that has truly been shown to have a high association with progression. 
This is a very interesting study that came out of uh, Salt Lake City, and Ken Ward was the primary author on this. But I think this has really hit the public in a big way because it's a, a test and concept by a company called ScoliScore, which is uh, provided by Axial. Uh, this is a DNA-based prognostic testing for curve progression for individuals in AIS. And what this investigative group wanted to do was to see if they could identify genetic markers that would predict those children at high risk of progression. And they used the genome-wide genome scans which were done on large populations in Utah because Utah has a very robust database on this. And they identified from about 2,200 individuals approximately 53 single nucleotide polymorphisms that seem to have a correlation and association with progression of scoliosis in a population of girls or white females who had scoliosis. They then combined this with the clinical parameter of Cobb angle and some gene-gene complex interactions, and from this we're able to design a probability score which when multiplied by 200 gives you a score. 0 to 50 is defined by them as having a low risk of progression. Uh, intermediate risk is 51 to 180. And very high risk groups are those with a score of greater than 180. Well, we've been all anxious and waiting for the publication to come out. And finally, in December, they've actually published some of their results. So when you look at this, they identified three cohorts of patients. One was a group of females coming from a school screening population. The second was a group of patients coming from a spine surgery practice. So these were referred in for evaluation, not all of them went to surgery. And the last was a cohort of males with scoliosis because males tend to be a very different group. And what they looked at was the numbers here are unfortunately a little bit small, but they're still significant. So they had about 277 patients in the first group. Of these, 176 or 64% had fairly low risk and every one of them turned out to have a low score on the scoli score. If you look at the spine surgery practice, as you come into that, about 257 patients, 131 of them had a low score, which is about 52%. And again, every one of them was correctly predicted, or most of them were correctly predicted by the SCOLI score. Now, these are patients who had a very low uh, risk of progression. Uh, and in fact, most of them did not progress. But subsequent follow-up has shown that in fact, some of the patients with low score still do progress to surgery. So the test is very good, but there is about a 1% incidence of which the SCOLI score may not predict accurately. What they're focusing on was the negative predictive value. So they're saying if you have a low score, what they're finding is a very high correlation with very low risk of progression. And that's of interest, but you have to remember that just from school screening alone, if you walk into the office and do nothing, you have a 97% negative predictive value. And so this is really a little bit of a question. The other thing that's been pointed out to me by clinicians who are very active in genetics is that these alleles are all minor alleles. And there are 57 of them in the gene array panel. And of these, not all individuals will have all 57. So in fact, there are going to be many that are missing from individuals. So the question of the weighting of the Cobb angle versus the allelic score is really one of the things that we need to understand better. And they acknowledge and admit that they want to get larger numbers of patients so they can assess the positive predictive value of the test, which would be most helpful. So some with low score do progress, but it seems to be pretty good. And the negative predictive value here may be of some help. Does that mean for you as a clinician, if somebody comes in and has this test and has a low score, should you just leave them from your office? And the answer so far is no. The authors of this study would say what it may do is it may help you to decrease the number of visits and number of evaluations because you have more comfort level of the patient having a low score. But what's really difficult is what if you have a high score and what if you have an intermediate score? Because we don't have good information about the positive predictive value, this makes it difficult. This only applies to Caucasian females with small curves because they only looked at kids with curves under 25 degrees, so it's not applicable to larger curves. And the real question is, is it better than clinical predictors at this time? So I think this is very much the right concept in the right direction, but as yet, it's still an evolving body of knowledge. Well, all of this effort, if we find this out and we apply these tests, can we, in fact, prevent progression to surgery? And there are many aspects of non-surgical treatment that are out there in the lay public. This is just a quick survey of some of the websites that are out there. The Cope's method was very popular back in the 1980s. The Schroth method was also very popular. And in fact, there are many people who participated in the physical therapy programs in the case as Klain showed you. And there are actually about 15 to 20 uh, peer-reviewed articles on their website. All of these are level two and three studies that talk about the effectiveness of the Schroth method.
Manipulation is very popular in the chiropractic literature, and the CLEAR program is very widespread throughout the United States. And electrical stimulation has sort of come and gone, but was also a very popular method for a long time. And you certainly see all these uh, tremendous washboard ab commercials on television where you can sit there, drink a beer, have this electric belt on your belly, and you can get washboard abs. Well, the same concept was used for scoliosis. Well, SOSORT is a Society on Scoliosis Rehabilitative Medicine. It's actually a very engaging group. And they recently published a uh, series of uh, reviews on this looking at level two cohort studies and found that there was no impact of electrical stimulation, that there was poor evidence that physical therapy could arrest progression of scoliosis, very weak evidence that physical therapy could help back pain and improve vital capacity, and no evidence that inpatient rehab was better than outpatient. So all surgical series, we have to keep in mind, are level three studies with re without really proof of benefit. So before we start casting stones at all this, we have to understand that our own literature is not much better. And currently, there are no level one bracing studies today. If we look at bracing history, it began with Hippocrates in the fifth century with a very large traction table. Quickly, this was modified by Galen to apply uh, external traction. And then we had a padded iron corset by Perry. And then Sayre started with traction followed by casting. But the modern era of bracing came about in 1946 by Blount, who used it following surgery and then expanded this to non-operative use in the 1950s. The modern history of bracing then takes forward, and we have TLSOs, which are underarm garments like this. We have the Boston brace out of Boston, uh, which is a lower profile, more off-the-shelf design. We have the Charleston bending brace, which is nighttime. You have the Providence brace, and then lastly, you have the Cottrell uh, brace, which is popularized by Rivard, that has sort of a rotation, derotation, balance posture uh, type of alignment. The common theme of this is that all of these are lower profile bases, becoming less and less obtrusive, but the indications have become better defined. So what do we know? And just quickly, prior to 1993, in a report released by the United States Preventive Task Force uh, group, they found that there were no controlled studies, that all of the studies were small case series with very short follow-up with highly variable indications for surgery, design, and wear. The risk of progression was all over the map, and there was unknown risk of progression to surgery from any of those studies. But bracing outcomes seemed to be better if you had a curve that was not too high in the spine, as smaller and flexible, and if the child was female. Since 1993, there has been one level two study, which is an SRS bracing study. This was about 286 patients from 19 centers in different countries. A uh, lot of criticism and a lot of controversy about the study, but it's the single best study of bracing to date. In general, they had three different groups, observation, bracing, and electrical stimulation. And if you break it down, basically, to the risk of progression greater than five degrees, which is what they focused on, there's about a 20% treatment effect, with 50% of kids in the observation and electrical stimulation group progressing at least five degrees. And if you look at the kids lost to follow-up and calculate a worst-case scenario, about 30% of the group treated in brace. There is not information in this study about the risk of progression to surgery. Since 1993, what's been done is that the SRS has now defined consistent bracing indications. So all studies are now viewed with this in mind, that you have to have a curve of at least 25 to 40 degrees, at least two years of growth remaining, uh, which is defined as RISR 0, 1, or 2, and less than one year postmenarchal. And Lori Dolan in 2007 had a review of 18 level three and four studies out of the literature which had reasonable criteria and could be assessed to look at the risk of progression to surgery for patients who were braced versus no brace. And what she found in that analysis was that there was no difference. That 23% of patients who received no brace had progression to surgery, that 22% had progression uh, despite bracing to the point of surgery. There's been more recent focus on compliance because there is an understanding that in fact kids, when they walk out your door, generally don't listen to you. I have teenagers and they generally don't listen to me and that's true of teenagers across the board. Historical studies show that the average compliance wear was about 60% and full compliance is only about 15% of what's prescribed. And a recent study that came out of Dallas by Katz and Herring showed that of those kids who had progression to the point of surgery, uh, the average brace wear was about 30% of prescribed wear time. And of those who had no progression, uh, had about 45% of, of wear time. So the results are pretty dismal that kids actually wear this thing, but there may be a dose-related response. And this is what the group in Dallas has found. Wear time at night is not as good as wear time at daytime, and this was defined as kids who had risk of progression. Those kids who wore the brace most consistently throughout the daytime hours had a lower risk. So there is ongoing now what started as a level one study funded by the NIH and by NIAMS, and we've been fortunate to participate in that, trying to look 
at bracing. And this was a prospective randomized trial, but it's been found nationally that it's very hard, even for non-operative treatment, to get kids to randomize. And so this is now converted to a level two cohort study, which is, uh, has in its place a patient choice limb as well. Because it was found of patients who were declining to enroll in the study that they were about evenly divided between I want to brace and don't want to brace. So this is ongoing. Hopefully we'll have the enrollment completed within the next uh, three to four months, and then the data analysis will continue as we follow patients out over time. So in summary, uh, for non-operative management, we have poor but developing diagnostic tools. We have evolving but as yet really unproven genetic prognostic tools to define patients' progression at risk. We have no proven predictable treatment to prevent surgery, and we really have a lack of evidence of any improvement in quality of life for the untreated condition, both for non-surgical and surgical means. Thank you. Thanks, Kit, for that great review of non-operative treatment. So I'm going to present a quick case here, and then we'll hear from Dr. Krangle about uh, operative management. So this is a case, an uh, 11-year-old female who is premenarchal, uh, so she's immature with a 43-degree curve, and uh, this is a thoracic curve as opposed to a lumbar curve. The, given the magnitude of the, of the curve, bracing was discussed with the family, but the family declined the brace and instead chose close observation. Well, close observation in four months resulted in a 61-degree uh, right main thoracic curve with a compensatory lumbar curve, and this would be classified as a lanky 1B curve. Uh, she's still uh, immature. She had an MRI performed, which showed no insidious uh, spinal cord disease. And so the family elected to proceed with surgery, and they underwent a selective thoracic fusion for this, uh, for this thoracic curve with a hybrid construct, and these are the operative results at one month. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Wally Krangle, who's the chief of our spine service at Seattle Children's Hospital, and he's going to discuss operative management. Um, I'm going to talk about, as briefly as possible, uh, a very large topic, which is surgical management of scoliosis. And again, the case, we're going to use this case and think of an overview, should we do surgery and why? Uh, what effect does our surgery have? When should we do surgery? Should we do it now? Should we wait till they're older? Um, and, wh and what are the goals of surgery? And then a brief discussion, of a summary of how we're going to approach what we're going to do and apply it to the case. So should we do surgery? Well, the, the in the 1960s, Alf Nockamson uh, came out with this study looking at 50-year follow-up of patients that had been seen initially in like 1913. Most of these patients did not have um, x-rays even initially, and they, he found really markedly increased morbidity and disability and mortality. And the thought was scoliosis is a horrible <coughs> disease that leads to the grave, and you should, uh, we need to do something to stop this. This is contrasted with uh, the more recent study that Dr. White brought up, which is probably our best natural history study of untreated late onset idiopathic or idiopathic scoliosis. These are people that get the uh, curves when they're adolescents as opposed to five years old or six years old, and their risk of progression is lower and so forth. And Dr. Weinstein looked at a 50-year follow-up of the untreated patients from uh, Iowa that uh, was, were seen by Dr. Ponsetti initially, and um, he made the statement at the conclusion of the study uh, that untreated adolescent idiopathic scoliosis causes little physical impairment other than back pain and cosmetic concerns. Unfortunately, the, the devil is in the details when you look at the outcomes. We, don't, we do not have a randomized controlled trial of long-term follow-up of surgical treatment versus non-surgical treatment for scoliosis, and we will never have one. Uh, people won't randomize. You need 25 or 50 year follow-up to understand what you're doing. So this is the best we're probably ever going to do. Uh, only a third of the patients are actually captured in this follow-up, and the mortality is compared it's assuming no difference in mortality compared to the general population for the two-thirds that are missing from the data. Um, and what it did show was that there was, they did have a lot more back pain at 50-year follow-up than the control population of patients that were found in nursing homes and so forth that were uh, 65 years old. Um, they also had a 10 times higher risk of shortness of breath with activity they had a poor self-image compared to controls, and the average thoracic curve that was 50 degrees or larger 
at age 15 was 89 degrees. So in summary, though it doesn't lead to the grave, it does in general lead to progressive deformity and most people don't like this. If we decide we're not going to do surgery or we're just going to wait and decide if it gets bad enough, uh, severe enough that we'll do it later, we have to consider if we're going to delay, what effect is this going to have on our outcomes? These are uh, summaries of large articles on adolescent scoliosis and on adult scoliosis surgery. These are complication rates. You can see the difference in major complication rates, minor complication rates, and total are very dramatic. So if you decide you're going to put off surgery until a patient is 60 years old, this may have a significant impact on the uh, eventual problems you're going to have taking care of the patient. But then we have to know what effect did the surgery have if we do it on a young patient on their quality of life. Um, at the last review, there were only three studies that had both preoperative and postoperative health related quality of life scores on individuals undergoing adolescent idiopathic scoliosis surgery. These are the pre-op and post-operative SRS-22, which is a disease-specific health-related quality of life score from these three studies. And we can see that pre-op and post-op, the post-op scores are actually somewhat better. Interestingly, pain is better which, when it's not thought of as a painful condition. So in general, most of the time, these are very skilled surgeons with uh, good controls and do a very nice job. And, in general, they are not decreasing the quality of life in the short term for patients. We do know, and there's an excellent study from Danielson and Nockamson, 25-year uh, follow-up of control group of braced patients, patients that don't have scoliosis, and patients who had surgery for curves of averaging 65 degrees. These were compared to those that didn't have surgery that had 35-degree curves, and they looked at uh, many factors, including SRS scores. At the bottom, you can see the SF36 scores for patients that don't have scoliosis, that were brace treated, and that had surgical treatment. And you can see there's very little difference. What isn't on there is patients who had 65 degree curves that were not treated. And I don't think any of us would expect that function would be better improved in those patients because even the brace treated patients have differences in range of motion that you can see compared to um, controls. Also, she looked uh, very carefully at um, physical function. There's a, a very nice data in there on all these patients. And you can see a really big difference between the range of motion people have in general with a fusion down to the lower lumbar spine versus the thoracic spine. Um, and the range of motion with the fusion to L1 is fairly similar to that of a brace control and not all that much different than controls. So there is some effect on range of motion and function, but in general, people lead relatively normal lives. I'm bringing this up because sometimes it is best to wait. There are certain things that people do that they will not be able to do if you do an extensive thoracic or thoracolumbar fusion. They may be able to perform these adequately with a selective thoracic fusion. And if the curve does not progress dramatically, you may be able to wait until after they're done with these activities, such as after they're out of high school or so forth. So um, some of these uh, life activities and so forth need to be taken into consideration. Our basic goals of surgery are going to be to prevent progression of deformity, to create a solid fusion. So we don't have to redo surgery and to avoid complications because since this is not a disease that in general is going to kill you, it's very important that you not create major morbidity with your surgery. So complications have to be looked at very carefully. We want to correct deformity, although outcome scores have little to do with how, how much deformity is corrected. And we want to try and think about preserving as much function and motion as possible. So, the main controversy, and I'll have to go over this very briefly, are which instrumentation, how are we going to do the construct, and what levels are we going to fuse? So when we look at which anchors to use, screws, hooks, wires, how many to put in, do we need one at every level? There are multiple studies recently, because probably a lot because of the cost of this instrumentation. And basically, 
there's very little correlation with how many anchors you put in and what type they are with regard to outcome in, in terms of curve correction, quality of life, and so forth. It makes very little difference so long as you are achieving your goal of preventing progression, uh, getting modest improvement of deformity, and uh, creating a solid fusion. And some things have come out about all pedicle screw constructs, which have become very, very popular, that they do tend to decrease thoracic kyphosis and increase proximal junctional kyphosis. Pedicle screws definitely have advantages in that when you use a pedicle screw, as in this all pedicle construct, um, you can rotate the spine and you can get rid of the rotational deformity that comes with scoliosis somewhat. However, you have to take into consideration that the rib the ribs have already changed shape. The ribs on the right are a different shape than the left. So even if you correct the rotation of the spine, the rib cage is, remains with a deformity. There are also some disadvantages to pedicle screws, particularly at the concave apex. The pedicles can be very small and sclerotic. And so even though there's a large safe zone for pedicle screw placement in a straight spine, in a deformed spine at the apex, there is not. You can use inside out technique where you're in, then outside the pedicle and in, but this, the amount of fixation we have with this is, is questionable. And if you're medial at all, you're very close to the spinal cord at the apex. We can also see that in scoliosis, in this close up of the thoracic deformity, often there is almost no pedicle in the concave apex to put a pedicle screw in, so it's, and it's hard to create one. So there are other alternatives, including sublaminar wires, which you can see often, you have a lot more room to put one in uh, that's away from the cord. And hooks, in general, many of them are not even placed in the canal, they're not sublaminar, and you can use them for deformity correction. So you can see, you can get excellent deformity correction using a combination of what seems most safe. So what, what instrumentation or construct am I gonna typically use? I'm going to use a screw near the top of the instruments that I put in to be sure I don't have dislodgement. But at the very top, I often will use hooks because I don't need to extend the incision so high to put a T2 pedicle screw in. And we, we seem to have less trouble with proximal junctional kyphosis by using hooks at the top. And at the concave apices, I'm thinking mainly about safety. If it's a very small pedicle, um, I will use uh, wires or hooks or, or span the area. The convex side often has a much larger pedicle and you can instrument that side and get rotational correction with just the concave side pedicle screws. Most of us prefer uh, pedicle screws in the lumbar area, particularly on the concave side because we can get excellent correction. It's a more mobile segment and we have better control of lordosis. A short discussion of levels, which levels am I going to do? Well, the general thought is, to me, that there is a difference in function and range of motion and quality of life somewhat to having a shorter fusion. And so if m most curves are, have a major right thoracic and minor left lumbar component, and if it's a borderline curve, it's not a huge lumbar curve, I will tend to do a selective fusion because the function of this thoracic, even though this thoracic fusion uh, in the middle, even though there's some deformity left in the lumbar spine, this is almost unnoticeable clinically, uh, much better range of motion than if we have gone to L4, say, which it shows on the right. Unfortunately, occasionally, people will have progression of the lower curve and require, so your incidence of needing to redo an operation is significantly higher when you're doing selective fusions, and that needs to be discussed carefully with the family. The upper level, we have uh, much more trouble now with um, left shoulder elevation following surgery with all pedicle constructs than we did with hooks because we get a lot more correction of the main thoracic curve and the upper thoracic curve is not as flexible. So it's um, looking like if you're going to do a major correction, not a minor correction, um, and you have a significant left upper thoracic curve, you're probably better off going to T2 than T4 because even in a patient with a right shoulder elevation, a fairly minor um, thoracic, upper thoracic curve, you can end up with pretty significant left shoulder elevation that patients don't like. And the amount of motion you lose going from T2 to T4 fusion is very small. In the lumbar spine, um, 
when you're trying to save levels. It's nice to save that extra level, but uh, probably there's not enough motion saved going to L3 versus L4 to make it worth it if you end up with progression of the deformity like what we see here. So we tend to favor being safe and avoiding further operations rather than trying to save one level. I thought I'd bring this slide up to discuss wh when and why do we do an anterior spinal fusion. Well, in primary lumbar curves, the posterior planning construct might in have to include a m many more levels than if, you, if we do an anterior spine fusion, where we will only do the measured curve. So the uh, x-ray here demonstrates the kind of correction, which we can get essentially 100% correction usually, with an anterior spinal fusion, many fewer levels than a representation of uh, what might have been a posterior construct in this type of a patient. And patients recover really nicely and quickly from this in general. A brief overview of the series of patients that we looked at over a three-year period done by the four surgeons at Children's, just to what are the overall major complication rates and so forth for this type of an operation. And these are 120 cases with an average length of stay of four days. There were only five ICU days out of 121 patients. We averaged the main thoracic curve correction of 65% and uh, average blood loss of 597. Most patients, it's actually rare to need a transfusion. Um, there were very few infections. There was one superficial infection and no major neurologic problems at all. So in general, our results have been good. I wanna summarize by saying that we wanna focus on avoiding complications, particularly neurologic problems, by thinking about safety first when we're doing, thinking about our constructs, about we do want to prevent progression and get a solid fusion, prevent further deformity, but we also want to think about preserving the function that uh, as much function as possible. So in this case, we uh, did a T4 to um, T11 or T12 fusion, and she has a very nice uh, clinical outcome and did well and is back to school at two weeks. Thank you. All right, so we're going to finish off with a, with a case presentation by Dr. Wagner, and then we hope we'll have a little time for discussion and questions and answers. I would introduce myself as the senior of the uh, surgeons who have talked to you so far today, and I want to, I want to say that I can remember uh, some problems, and I guess problematic scoliosis would be another way of saying uh, I made a mistake or my judgment was wrong. And I thought I might share with you a case today that, uh, that has some of those uh, characteristics. So as we, uh, as we look, this is a 11-year-old uh, young boy who presented with uh, scoliosis that was picked up by his pediatrician. He's a very athletic, high-performing athlete, both in football and wrestling. He has a lot of family support for his sports. There's no family history of uh, scoliosis, and he has no back pain. This was the original x-ray uh, by his pediatrician showing a uh, curve. And uh, I think that if you want to classify this, you, we can probably call this a lanky two. And there's a small thoracic, two thoracic curves of a higher thoracic curve to the left and a more prominent one to the right. When I saw him, he was 12 years old and one month old, and there's a 38 degree curve. I've, taken all the lines off the, so you can see the uh, x-rays uh, as clearly as possible. And so I would ask uh, our own panel if there's any comments you might make, Wally, about this case and what you might predict. As a 12-year-old growing boy, probably is going to grow for four more years or so and has had progression of his curve, but it's 38 degrees now. Yes. And uh, as usual, um, not having any significant symptoms and his neurologic exam is normal there would be a discussion about whether to use a brace or not. Boys are, have notoriously uh, significant difficulties with compliance, and there's, it's hard to know how much effect you're going to have on the natural outcome. We would be talking about whether to wear a brace or not. I, I think, um, but when I think of this, I think of what I would want for my child. And um, I hate to say it, but I think it's worth a shot at a brace, personally, if they can stand it. It's not worth the family breaking up about a screaming, yelling fight every morning going out, whether they're going to wear the brace. But if they're willing to try it, uh, there's 
modest evidence that sometimes it makes a difference and the family seems happier, to, happier in general to have felt like they've done everything they could to avoid having to go to the next step of surgery. So that, that would be sort of my discussion with them. So I, I think that that's a summary and I'm just going to ask quickly to uh, Kit and to Klain, would you brace this child if it's yours? There are actually four published studies of bracing in boys specifically because it's such a small subset and the impact relative to the natural history reported a long time ago suggests that there's no difference. Um, my son, and this is a very individual decision, there's no way he'd wear a brace and I wouldn't fight with him. So I think to Wally's point, uh, I wouldn't have enough compelling evidence to say I'm going to force him to do that. Knowing what you know, would you brace your son at 12 years old with this curve? And this is a question to the whole audience. Put up your hand if you would brace him. So it looks like approximately one third. And I'll tell you, this is not an easy decision because you have the mother, grandmother, and father in front of you. And the decision is often made in, a, in somewhat of a maturing experience for the whole family as to what they're going to do. And I think you're putting on something that's not going to hurt them. And it uh, certainly uh, cures a lot of family uh, discussion. So uh, I think there, there's many factors in doing it. So we put a brace on. And this brace is moderately or mod modestly effective in that the curve comes to 32 degrees. The upper curve is 15 degrees. And he's now 12 years and three months. But at 13 years and two months, he's now progressed to a 54 degree curve. And the top curve is 21 degrees. So I'll bring it back to Wally at this point. Um, I think that uh, you can follow it very closely. I don't, the brace isn't working. I don't think it's, you need to persist with the brace. You could either follow it closely or, but probably you need to start a discussion about thinking about surgery at some point, whether you can nurse him through his football career and he'll, his curve will only end up at 65, which is reasonable. Um, we don't know. Uh, we don't want to end up with an 85 degree curve. So the curve appears to be malignant or getting worse uh, in a significant way. And uh, the question that comes now, Wally, is if he was going to play football, could he play with a thoracic scoliosis fusion? I think his performance will be a little bit less, and his family is generally going to be very against it. So I'd say most people probably end up stopping playing. I wouldn't absolutely prevent him from playing myself. So this was the outcome of his surgery. Now, the upper curve was done to control the shoulder uh, asymmetry, and in fact, it worked. He was very, uh, his shoulders are absolutely level, and he has a... Uh, a pretty straight spine. It's a, uh, we have derotated him significantly with the pedicle screws. And uh, this is the immediate post-operative time. And I only mentioned that there's probably 15 degrees of curvature below the uh, scoliosis surgery. So I'm going to take you at three months, six months. We're now at 40 degrees, and we progress off to 45 degrees. So after many years of doing scoliosis, I have to uh, realize that I have probably created a certain problem that's difficult. So while at this point he has a mild amount of back pain, he's still playing in sports. He's back to full sports, including wrestling. And, uh, and he has 45 degree curvature. And he's uh, now 15 years old. Would, no, you, well, would, I, you, would you extend his fusion or not? Uh, when he feels like he has to do it. Uh, I think he's gonna need to go down to L4. You're gonna need to go down to L4, and uh, I don't think you have to rush into doing that. I think his curve's probably gonna progress a little bit, but it may not. He may be fine for 30 years. It might be that in a year it's bad. And you have to do something, it's reasonable to do it if he's having a lot of symptoms. So I began seeing him at the end of football season. I watched him through all wrestling. And it came to June, and he had, uh, had had significant discomfort and really cosmetically become unattractive with a very displaced or uh, and with a major asymmetry of his thoracic, uh, of his uh, junctional area. So his fusion was extended. And I think we've learned that we can very often stop at three when we used to think of stopping at four. And I think that's one of the major things that's changed 
in our scoliosis uh, judgment. And uh, so at this point, he is, uh, he is uh, 15. He's been extended. His spine is straight. Now would you allow him to play football, Wally? I think his performance is going to be a problem. I, I, I would sort of advise against it at this point with the progression he had before. But. Kit, do you have any thoughts about it? Well, I think it's a tough choice. Uh, there was a survey of the SRS members about 10, 12 years ago as to how many let their patients play football after surgery. And it was actually evenly split. It was 50-50. So I don't know that there's a consensus on this. And my feeling has been that it's, it's a family choice. You advise them of potential risks. And I agree with Wally that it's a little harder for him to protect himself in a high-velocity game. So the family has to understand that there's risk not only of injury to the back, but of other areas. And his risk may be higher. So I had some questions of myself. Did I fail to classify this case correctly? Did the classification system fail to predict the progression of, a, of the lumbar uh, curve? And is there, is there a possibility that we should brace a patient after the primary curve has been operated on? So I will ask Plain, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I don't think you classified the curving appropriately. This is a thoracic curve. Um, and I don't remember exactly where the center, where the you know, stable vertebra was, but uh, you know, a, a selective fusion down to L1 is pretty usual and, and reasonable. Um, we all, I advise every patient before surgery that there's a 5% reoperation rate because of our inability to correctly predict how far we should go and, and, and the risk of infection, et cetera. So, um, that, that, that's part of the, of, of the process as well. Um, so, and as far as bracing after surgery, um, I, uh, I only brace after anterior uh, fusions because those are at higher risk for pseudarthrosis, particularly with a single rod. Um, but I would, I would not brace after, after surgery because I would presume that I've done the appropriate surgery in the first place. Kit, any comment? Well, I think it's a tough case. I think we do guess wrong sometimes. And although we quote uh, reoperation rates, the Dallas group was as high as 10%. And I think we need to do a better job. So I, I would say it's classified correctly, but the lengthy classification has actually not been well correlated to positive outcomes long term. It's helpful from a descriptive term, just like the King classification was, but it's still tough. So I think that's where I'll end today.